So yeah, arcana is um, a word from uh, similar to arcane, which means like knowledge or wisdom for the initiated, you know, mysteries, that kind of thing. Um, there's a bit of hubris in that title, I'll, I'll admit. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Dan Hanks. I'm a system administrator at uh, Adobe, a great place to work. We're hiring if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, I, I believe there's positions open for engineers. We've got some open for sysadmins. Um, and it's really a really good place to work. If you want, you can come up and I'll just gush for about a half hour about how much I like working there. Um, so anyways, um, I started playing around with Linux uh, back in 1997. Um, and if I'm doing my math right, that's about 15 years. And so when you start putting together a presentation like this, you, you start thinking, yeah, I've got some things I want to share. I've learned a few things. But the, by the time you get to the end of putting together a presentation like this, you're realizing, man, there's still a ton of stuff I don't know that I need to learn. So it's, it's been a really good experience. And I hope um, that there's something here that you find useful as we, we get moving. So to start out, I want to talk about my solution, my favorite solution to most problems, okay? <laughs> right? But it's not exactly what you might think it is, okay? Solutions read the full manual, right? Okay. So unfortunately in our generation though, we have a little bit too much of this going on. Too long didn't read, right? But and, and, and in our, our collective attention deficit disorder, that's became more and more of a problem. But fortunately, among the non-neurotypical types like us, um, we tend to be able to hyper-focus on things that are of interest to us. So if we convince ourselves that the things we're reading in the man pages, the info pages, and the online documentation is crucial and interesting, we have the amazing ability to hyper-focus and read the full manual and glean the arcane bits of wisdom that you can find buried in the man pages of any command in Linux. So stay away from TLDR in this case and you'll, you'll find lots of good stuff. Okay, so again, most of your problems have already been solved for you. You don't need to write the clever script. You don't need to hack or patch the code. You don't need to write the 2,000 character one-liner. It's really fun to do that though. Um, you just need to use the features that your tools already have or use a tool that you didn't know you had. Um, Spend more time building your product and less time writing the tools to get your job done. Um, although it is a bit of a balance between how long will it take me to come up with the hack or the one-liner versus how long will it take me to find that tool or command line guard that'll do it for me. I don't know, a bit like the halting problem if you've done uh, computational theory and computer science. Anyways, the spirit of this uh, presentation is know your tools. Know your tools. There's a ton of wonderful <coughs> tools available to us when we're using Linux, open source, generally any kind of Unix really. Mac OS, um, do we know all the things that, that stuff in bin, user bin and s bin, do we know what they all do? Do we know what all their command line options are? I don't yet, but you know, someday I hope to. <laughs> Does anybody? Yeah, exactly. So it, I want to kind of walk through a bunch of you know, things that I've found over the years that hopefully are useful, hopefully will help you get your jobs done um, better or more easily or faster. Um, and so my criteria in trying to choose these was um, and in balancing with the target audience of you know beginners, intermediates, and maybe some graybeards, um, was to make find stuff that was you know either relatively or very obscure but useful. Okay, so hopefully by the end of this talk we'll come away having met that uh, objective. So here's our Arcana exploration strategy, and I'll have to um, give you a warning ahead of time. I come at this from a a very um, CentOS Red Hat-ish colored glasses perspective. So I apologize to those who are uh, Ubuntu slash Debian users, um, but uh, I think a lot of the principles are, are similar here. So the basic idea is you see some tool that's used, LS perhaps, right? Let's do an RPM QF. Let's find out what package installed that binary. In this case, it turns out it was the core utils. Well, what other curious tools or binaries did core utils install? Let's do an RPM-QL and list everything in the bin directory that uh, core utils install. And you have these things like arch and base name and cat and chagroup and chmod and shown and cut and date. All sorts of really interesting tools that you can go explore. Okay, here's another way. Okay, where's the SSH binary, binary used? We use that all the time, right? Is there a lot more to that command that maybe I don't know about? So where's SSH? User bin SSH. What package installed user bin SSH? RPM-QF is installed by the OpenSSH clients package. 
What other interesting things did that package install? RPM QL, open SSH clients, grip out the bin directories. Ooh, we've got some interesting things. SSH add, SSH agent, SSH copy ID. What does that do? SSH key scan. What does that do? Ooh, shiny, fun things to look at. Um, SSH copy ID. This is a way. How many are familiar with SSH keys? Okay, most everybody. Okay. How many of you dislike the dance when you have to distribute your public keys? Okay, copy them over to the remote machine. Uh, make sure you've got the perm set right on SSH authorized keys. You don't have to worry about any of that. Just use SSH copy ID. <coughs> Plug in the remote host you want to send it. It sends them off and make sure the permissions are set up right. Adds your, your uh, uh, public key to the authorized keys files and you're set. Pretty nice. Um, and if you have a particular key you want to copy over, just specify that with dash I to the key. Okay. So speaking of SSH keys, yeah? One quick note about that. If you're on a Debian or Ubuntu box uh -huh. and on the SSH copy IDs to a uh, Red Hat based system with SE Linux mm -hmm. enforcing, uh, it doesn't set the labels correctly. What oh, is it? The labels? The okay. Keys filed, so you'll need to restore those. Okay. Using which command? Uh, restore com. Very good. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't cover a lot of SE Linux in here. That is another great, um, interesting. Um, thing that I think unfortunately too many um, of us turn it off as the first thing we do after installing a system because it tends to, yeah there you go there you go <laughs> right there you go so I, I just recommend you know go out look at it give it a second glance it's some pretty cool stuff it can do if you can learn to work inside of its paradigm anyways let's talk about SSH keys and so kind of as we walk through this this is kind of this exploration strategy we found this these interesting utilities now we're going to kind of walk through them and see what they do how many of you are familiar with using SSH uh, oh we already talked about SSH keys so um, SSH keys allow us to SSH from host to host without having to type in our password. A little more secure because passwords and keys are not transferred over the wire. Um, so to create an SSH key pair, use this command called SSH keygen. It spits out a bunch of stuff. It asks you where do you want to save that key. You give it a place to save it. And you add, add a passphrase so that if you want to use or unlock that key, you have to type in a passphrase. It's generally a good idea. Although there are situations where you may want passphraseless keys that can be useful. Um, and it says your identification or your key has been saved, your key pair has been saved in that. You'll get both a key file and a .pub as a public key. Um, here's the fingerprint for that. Um, and then there's a ton of other useful options. If you're really security conscious, you want to use maybe a different uh, number of bits in your encryption key, different moduli. I'm not exactly sure what that is, but uh, lots of other options in SSH keygen. So, and this little notation here that I put on some of these commands, that tells you what section of the man page in. Some man pages have different sections. Like if you look, if you just man cron tab, not super useful. Man 5 cron tab tells you what all the fields in your cron entries are. Really useful. So just a hint. Let's see. Now you distribute that key that you made, SSH copy ID dash I, and we're going to specify this key over to the remote host. Um, now we SSH to the remote host, but we still have to type in that passphrase, and that's not very fun because that's more keystrokes that I have to type. Um, although it is a little bit more secure because my password's not being sent over the wire, albeit encry encrypted. Um, so let's hire an agent to do that for us. And so we noticed in that output of when we looked at what SSH installs, that command SSH agent. Fortunately, SSH agents are easy to come by. Now an agent comes from a Latin word, uh, meaning someone who does something for us. So if you think about like an agency, an agency is like a company that does like advertising or something for another company, okay? So an agent is gonna be this little process that types in our passphrase for us so we don't have to worry about it. So let's run SSH agent. Well, in first it's not very uh, impressive. All it does is it spits out a bunch of shell variables. Um, and so to get it to work, you either have to copy and then run those commands, essentially verbatim, you copy them and execute them. Or you can invoke SSH agent by just back putting it in backslashes. That will execute all of those commands there for you. Or you can do SSH agent and then pass in a shell to, it to execute. And so what that's going to do, if you run it this way, it's going to set up those variables inside the shell you're currently running in. If you do it this way, it's going to start a new shell with that environment set for you. Now with that in place, we do SSH add. And that set tells SSH agent, hey, we're going to add a key to you, or we're going to give you a key that you can use to SSH for us. So I do SSH add, the name of the key that I made, and it's going to ask you for that passphrase, and that'll be the last time you have to put that passphrase in as long as your agent is running. 
Okay, so it says identity added. And now I can SSH without passphrases or passwords. We SSH the remote host and bada boom, bada bing, we're right in the, the, the host. Really nice and useful. So you can set up that SSH agent stuff in your shell initialization files, bash RC, bash profile, that kind of thing. Um, I do an SSH add at the beginning of my X session. So in my GNOME config, I say run this program when I log in, and it does an SSH add. SSH add is smart enough to figure out, oh, hey, he's running in an X contact, and he pops up a little GUI window to ask me for my passphrase. That's the only time I have to type in that passphrase, and then all of the other shells I spawn from that X session inherit that agent, and I'm good to go. So. Let's see here. Some other options to SSH add. Dash L will show you all keys that you've added to that agent. If you want that agent to only be active for a certain period of time, you can say dash T, in this case, three weeks. I only want you to be doing this for three weeks. Maybe it's just a few hours. Maybe you're in one of the secret government vaults and you only want you know, five minutes. Whatever. Um, if you want, you can lock the agent. Say so you have to step away from your terminal and you're afraid of your buddies who know your, for some reason your login password, your, your console, and, but you don't want them to get into this shell, you can lock that agent. This is hadx x it'll ask you for a lock password, which is not the same as your passphrase. And then you type it in again, and it'll say agents locked. And then if you try to SSH to a host, you'll, have, you'll get the regular password prompt. It won't hand out that uh, passphrase for you. To unlock it, dash capx, um, enter that password that you did, and the agent's now unlocked for you. So anyways, obscure, arcane little bits of things, but may come in useful sometime. Who knows? Um, let's see, agent forwarding. This is really super useful if you've got a large enterprise, a whole bunch of machines. You don't have to go you know, typing your passphrase or setting up agents on all of these machines, so you just use agent forwarding. All you do in your local.ssh config file, just put this forward agent yes into that config file. When you jump onto a new host, it'll forward that agent functionality for you. There's a lot going on underneath the hood that I won't cover here. But it'll forward on that agent functionality for you, so now when you need to jump to another machine in your enterprise, as long as it's got your public keys there, you'll just hop along without having to type in passphrases or passwords. Really nice and handy. Let's see, and speaking of the SSH client config, there's a ton of stuff you can do in this file. It's usually stored in um, .ssh, in your home directory, .ssh config. See section five of the SSH config man page for all the things you can stuff in there. A favorite thing I put in there is the server alive interval of 60 seconds. And sometimes you get these aggressive firewalls, like your network team doesn't like open TCP connections hanging around or something, and so they say, well, if you've got a stale connection, we haven't seen any traffic on that, close it off. And so, you know, my shell that I had open, and maybe I forgot to run screen or whatever, my shell is now closed. When I get back to it, you know, I go to a meeting, my shell is closed. Put that in there, um, and every 60 seconds, SSH will send a little message back over to the server, the server will respond. The firewalls will see some traffic, and it'll keep your connections open. Um, another thing you can do is put host and user aliases. Um, let's say I want to create an alias called my host. Um, when I log into that host, let's say you go to work for a company, and for all your life you've been logging in as the user, I don't know, Woosnot or whatever, right? And, um, but when you get to the company, they have a strict policy that uh, usernames are first initial, last name, or something like that. And you just don't want to use that. On your local machine, you're using the favorite username you've been using forever. Just set up an alias like this in your SSH config file. Um, so when I go to this alias, pass in this username. What's that? Yeah, yeah, I'll have them. Um, use this username, um, use this key. So if you have multiple keys you're using for different hosts or different uh, organizations or whatever it may be, and use this host name. So now when I go SSH to my host, which is the name of the alias, I end up going to my other name. Can you guys see the mouse pointer on there? No, oh, my apologies, okay. So when I SSH to this alias that I've set up, I end up with my other name, which uh, was the user we need to log in as, to some real host name here, and it'll ask you for that password. There's really, there's a ton more options. We're just scratching the surface here. Yeah? One really cool thing, too, is that uh, some systems set up bash auto-completion mm -hmm. based off the, yeah. the host names in there, so you can tab complete my host. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Yes? Also, also one really cool thing about this is like when, you, when you set that, you can also use uh, SSH proxy to go through a bash <coughs> via to execute something like netcat through the bash. Oh, yeah, so you can set up like a command to run when you run yeah. that. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. And again, if you've got little additions to throw onto these, that's what this is all about. Yeah? One thing, uh, one thing about this that saved me a ton of times in the past is if I've got, if I've got scripts running that want to go to these sites, 
through SSH and then somewhere down the road like the IP address changes or something changes it, it's not it's not a big deal for me at all I just mm -hmm. go in and change this file and everything I've done mm -hmm. still works and everybody else that can do that is trying to figure out where they put the IP address for a service that doesn't work anymore. Excellent cool thank you Okay, so again, look at the man page here, SSH config section five. Very, very, lot, tons of stuff you can do there. Really cool. Um, escape sequences. Um, escape sequences lets you alter the behavior of your SSH connection midstream. Really kind of fun. Um, the default uh, escape character is the, the tilde, um, but you can override it by doing SSH e and then specifying, uh, specifying a character. If you want to suspend your current shell, you do a blink, uh, just to enter which is usually what you typed last anyways, twiddle and then control Z, and now you're back on the host where you start. You've suspended the running session, like doing a control Z on any other process locally. So if you're out on another machine, say, oh, I gotta do something quick on the machine I'm necessitating from, do this, you're on there, and then you just FG to resume like you normally would some other process, and bam, you're back on the other host. Okay, kind of, kind of useful. Um, let's see here, let's say you've got SSH tunnels. How many of you are familiar with SSH tunnels and forwarding, that kind of thing? Okay, if you're not, read the man page for SSH. What you can do is you can set up these cool SSH tunnels. So if you've got like um, an aggressive firewall you're trying to circumvent, and I didn't say that publicly, or if, you're, um, or if you have some other network condition whereby you need to be able to access from a local machine resources on a remote network as if you were local to that network, SSH tunnels and forwarding comes in really, really handy. It is really a really uh, a Swiss Army knife of networking functionality. The SSH tool is. Um, so if you do your um, uh, so you hit a blank enter or just a regular enter, you type twiddle and then capital C, um, you get this little SSH prompt that you see up here. And if you do question mark, that shows you what you can do inside there. So now we can set up a locally. Um, the dash L means like uh, forward any traffic on local ports over to remote hosts in, in, in the, the, where you're connected to. Uh, similar options there, dynamic binding if you want to set up uh, proxies. Um, if you want to cancel some of the forwarding rules you've got in place that are going on, you can do that. If you want to list all the connections that are currently being forwarded through your SSH session, just do enter twiddle pound. Um, if you want to just Terminate it, so let's say you've got a frozen shell and you can't get any response out of it, you want to go back to where you started. Um, you hit uh, the, the em empty enter, the twiddle, and the dot, and then you're back to where you, the machine you started up. Note that if you're on a chain of SSHs and you do that, you get dropped right back to the first host you were SSHing from. So be aware there. We could spend a whole other uh, session talking about SSH tunnels. We won't do that. I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. Um, this is a great book, 600 pages of SSH Arcana, if you can believe that. There's a book, 600 pages about this thing. Lots of cool stuff there. Um, let's see here. So now, let's go forth and apply this Ar Arcanic search methodology to everything else on your Linux system. We just explored SSH. What else is there to explore? Tons. Oh, here's one more tidbit of SSH. Um, SSH key scan. If you're ever provisioning a network where you're setting up a whole bunch of machines and you don't want to have that annoying message when you go to a machine, you've just barely provisioned it, says, hey, I don't recognize this host key that I'm looking at when I'm trying to SSH into this thing. Well, just run an SSH key scan and pass in a list of hosts or dash F, uh, let's see, yeah, dash F to pass in a file that's got a list of hosts, one per line, and it will go out in parallel. It'll open up a connection to each of those hosts. It'll read the SSH host public key pull it back and spit it all out for you to use. And it doesn't require any user input? No user input. That solves so many build server problems I've had in the past. Good. That's exactly what I was hoping to hear from this session. Excellent. <laughs> Woohoo. Okay. Um, so having to just turn off host key verification, which is not a Yeah, solution. exactly. Very good. Thank you. So I hope for fact, wonderful. I had to do that yesterday, so I'm about to change that script while I was. Excellent. Cool. Fantastic. Great. Okay, um, so you can uh, pass in dash F to read all your hosts from a file. You can, um, or scan them from standard in. We're going to talk about this little guy a little bit later. Okay, if you want to echo your, or, or pipe in your list of host names, you can do that, and we'll talk about that funny dash character. Uh, oh yeah, I was going to highlight that. So, let's talk about that dash character. You'll see that show up from time to time, and it's actually really useful. 
Um, let's say you have a file on this machine and you want to diff it with the file on another machine. Well, normally you might copy that file over to the local machine, run your diff and do that. But why do that? Just uh, cat your file, pipe it to SSH. Here's another nice feature of SSH. Anything you pipe into SSH gets sent as standard out on the other side. So then you can pipe that in to something else. Okay? So let's cat that file. Let's pipe it into SSH to our remote host. And on that remote host, we're going to run diff-u some file, which is on the remote host, and then with dash, which is the standard input, going into diff. And that standard in is this file that we catted on the local host. So then we'll get nice diff output between the file on the local host and the file on the remote site. Okay? Make sense? All right. Question? Yeah. So you get your uh, two different kinds of quotes there, some of which are editor. That is PowerPoint being too smart for its own good. The one line has three quotes. Is that yeah, your no type type match quotes? Like Do I missing? Let's see. Yeah, I'm missing you one. You're right. There you go. How's that? Better? OK. Yeah. Get rid of that one. Sorry. My bad. And those are, those are just standard single Those are just standard oh, single like ticks. No, those are not uh, bits of Arcana. That's bits of PowerPoint <laughs> stupidness. So there you well, go. Uh, more specifically, I was looking at that, and I'm pretty sure that if you did use a back tick, it's going to try to ex execute that dip locally. Yeah, so be aware. <coughs> be aware. <coughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So if you want to go the other way around, maybe you want to see. When I'm diff, I'm really kind of particular. Because I, I, I want to do, when I do a diff, I want to do a to and a from. I say, what happened in this file that changed going to this file, right? And so my order of diffs is really important, just the way my brain works. I've got to be able to see which way it works. So if I want to go the other way, and I want to diff, look at the file on the remote host and see what changed in the file on my local host, I SSH to the remote host. I cat that file, which will come out as standard out on my side. And I just pipe that into diff, the local file, with dash, which is what's coming in to standard input. Okay, Kind of useful. Um, now, here's another thing. Um, Vim is really good about syntax coloring. It'll, it'll highlight diff output for you, which is really, really useful. For, for me, I'm just really visually oriented, so I like having you know colors. Um, and so normally, you can do diff file 1, file 2, output it to my diff, and then Vim my diff. But Let's just use this, this thing here. Let me demo that. It's kind of fun. Um, let's see here. Let's run over here. Can you guys see that font? OK. Is that big enough? Bigger, yes. Let's go a little bigger. OK. Um, change settings. Yeah, my eyes are not particularly good, so um, I like bigger fonts. Let's go up to there. Better? OK, let's try that. So we've got a few files in here. Let's open um, file one. And let's do one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Something like that, right? Let's edit file two. And let's add seven, eight, nine, <coughs> ten. Actually, no, let's not do that. We want to do a diff CP1, two, two, right? That's a right two. Let's edit two. Oops. Nothing like typing in front of an audience. Let's get rid of these two lines. Okay. So now if I diff one and two, we get that. I don't like that kind of diff output. I usually use dash u. It's a little more makes a little more sense in my brain for some reason. Um, so that tells me that to get from one to two, you have to rip out those two lines. And that's your diff, right? Um, if we do um, if we do this though, if we pipe that into Vim and we tell Vim, hey, I want you to edit what's coming in on standard in. And I get that, and it's in color. Isn't that fun? <laughs> okay, I use this all the time. I, 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 I came across that and said that is nice. So yeah, if you're diffing files, you want a nice colorized output, and you don't have to have a temporary file in the place that you have to manage. There you go. Okay. Um, now you may also be familiar with. Uh, yeah, OK. Bang. There we go. Um, yeah, that's one thing you'll notice if you do that. You have to queue bang to get out, because it thinks you've edited that file for some reason. Uh, I haven't figured that one out. Because it's no longer the same as, as, uh, as standard in. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Um, so a little bit of an annoyance there, but still hopefully useful. Um, but yeah, also another thing to keep in mind, Vim um, has this lovely functionality called Vim-D, or, or they've got an alias called Vim-Diff. Um, actually, let's do this. Vim-Diff, you go one, Vim-Diff one and two, and you get this lovely side-by-side -side comparison. And it's really useful. 
But sometimes I just want you know the regular standard diff output, pipe it through vim dash, and you've got beautiful colorized output of a regular diff output. Okay. Let's see, where am I back here? There we go. Um, let's see here, what's next? How much time we have? Okay. Or uh, you can use the dash to do a poor man's rsync. Um, this is really kind of arcane. I don't know how useful it is, but anyways. Tar, I'm going to extract, um, I'm going to actually create a tar archive. Z means make it zip, C means create it, V means be verbo verbose, F specifies here's the file that I'm going to use. Um, to, here's the, normally F you would specify here's the file I'm going to create with this, this tar invocation. Dash here says just spit that all out, create, spit out the tar ball you're making to standard out. Okay. And then I'm going to do that, I'm going to tar up that local directory, I'm going to pipe that through SSH to the remote host, and on the remote host I'm going to tar ZXVF, so Z, zip it up, uh, extract, so we're creating one on the local host, we're going to extract it on the remote host, verbose, um, and then the file that we're going to extract is coming in from standard input, which we piped into SSH, we're going to change directory to dash uh, to some remote dir before we do that. So you've now tarred up a directory on the, on the local system, you've piped it over SSH, and you've extracted it on the remote machine. Poor man's rsync, but it could be, interest, could be useful. I bet that's faster than, if you had a whole bunch of files, I bet that's faster than SCP. Probably. Because it's, there's not, not so much back and forth. Not, not only that, that, but it will preserve a lot of file, file permissions uh, and, permissions and, and yeah, ownership. In fact, sometimes, I know, I know some people who basically do that on the local host in order to prevent, in order to make sure that they Everything, but sometimes it's a pain to get CP to, like I think sometimes it's impossible to get CP to preserve. Right. Cool. So. Um, if you leave off the F flag anyway, doesn't it type the standard output? Does it? Probably does. Thank or you. There may be a flag that pipes it out to standard output anyway, so it, it does go to standard output by default. By default? And, and if you don't specify dash in it, when extracting it reads from standard input. Excellent. Well, little, Thank you. Little, if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> yeah, you can do it this way. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, let's see, there's something else I was going to say, but it's now slipped my mind. Okay, gone. Um, all right, uh, let's see. On a related note, um, you sometimes see this dash dash. A lot of programs have a dash dash. Let's say you have RM, and somehow you've managed to create a file that starts with a dash, and you're trying to remove it. Ever had that happen? Yeah, okay. Just do RM dash dash, and that tells RM, hey, I'm not going to pass any more command line arguments after this, so just treat everything after this as an argument to the RM, as a file argument. So then you can remove that crazy file that starts with the dash. There you go. Arcane, useful? Yeah, sometimes. Uh, let's see here. Oh, yeah, and I just want to highlight this little um, backslash here. That was intentional. You've probably seen that sometime. That's really useful if you want to break up a command line into multiple lines. It's really good for writing documentation where you want to be able to cleanly format you know, some long command invocation, but yet still make it so you can copy and paste it. So I can still copy that, backslash is included, paste it in the shell, the shell knows what to do with it. Kind of useful. All right. Where are we at? Oh, goodness, we got to move. Um, shell loops. Um, I hope I use these every day. I hope if you use the shell that you use them too. They're really, really nice. Um, basically, you're going to do set x to be a variable. We're going to look for something in some kind of list. Now, list can be generated by just a list of file names, a list of things, a list of strings. You can pass in wild cards for a file in star.txt, for a file in star, for a file in backslash the output of find home. Then do some list of commands, and you can reference $x, which will be set to the item in the list that it's now iterating over. Um, and then done. So for file in the output of ls, do cat that file, and done. Cat everything in the, in, uh, in the directory. Or cat star will accomplish the same thing, but for il illustration purposes. For dir in find everything slash home do chown root dollar dir. That's like, you know, hostile takeover kind of action. Um, for file and start at text, do cat dollar file, same sort of idea there. Okay, so just wild cards. Um, loops can be nested. So for the directory in, so find slash home, and for every dir inside there, do, oh, here's another loop. For every file in ls that directory, do echo the dollar dir slash dollar file. Um, done, done. So you can nest loops. Okay, if you need to, sometimes that's useful. Um, but watch out for lists that get too large. Um, if you try to pass in too large in a, an argument list, Bash will complain, say, oh, I don't know what to do with that. Then you have to move to something like xargs, um, and I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. There's tons there you can do with xargs. Find slash home. For everything you find in there, churn root on that. Okay? 
let's see here. Oh, and here's a little bit of, uh, you notice that EG? Here's a little bit of Latin Arcana that you get for free just for coming. Um, so EG is, and it just, you know, you can sound like an English knob or something like that. Um, EG is Latin for exempli gratia, which you use in place of, for example. Um, IE is Latin for it est, used in place of that is, or uh, vis is Latin for be delicate, um, used in place of namely. Etc. is Latin for et cetera, uh, meaning literally, and others, meaning things. Um, and then you have this et al, which is Latin for et, and then you have options here, et ali for masculine, alii for feminine, alia for neuter, and it means and others, speaking of people. So if you have like a list of authors, you might see Joe and Jim and so forth, et al, which is they're talking about the rest of the people who wrote the book. You also have this et alibi that I found, which means and others, speaking specifically of places. Anyways. Probably didn't want to know that, but there you go, free Latin. Oh, and speaking of this curly brace expansion that we use, let's talk a little bit about that because that's useful in Bash too. So, um, curly brace expansion, love this, use it all the time, okay? Um, for, here's a for loop, that's why we introduced the for loop so we could illustrate this. For server in larrymoncurly.example.com do echo server. What that does is that expands those three in uh, concats each one of those elements in the list with what follows it or what comes before it or wherever it falls in that string. So it's basically a string generator, right? So for server in larry.example.com, mo.example.com, curly.example.com, do echo the server and you get that. Okay, really super useful. Um, for server in www, and notice this empty element, we'll talk about that, 2345.example.com, do echo server, www.example.com. So empty elements don't get anything from there, but sometimes you need that, right? Okay, so that lists out all your servers like there. Brace expansion, really, really useful. Um, it can save typing. If you have two really long files and you gotta copy one to the other, just type it once and put your old and your new extensions at the end in a brace expansion. Well, what that expands out to is cp some path to file that old, some path to file that new. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, cool. I like hearing that, that's, that's so good. You can use it. At the beginning to head things, you can use it at the end. Anywhere in the string. I don't you can know. use it anywhere in the string. Anywhere in the string, and it expands it. Yes, white space delimited, I assume, and it'll just expand that to Yes, white space delimited, yeah, just expands it to that. My very favorite trick. Love this thing. Use it all the time. Okay, cool. Um, how many of you ever done this? <coughs> right? You're, you're making an RPM build environment? Okay. There you go. Make dir p rpm slash sr build source of spec rpms, and you can nest these guys, right? Okay, i386. So inside rpms, I want i386, no arch, and i686. Bada boom, bada bang. There you go. You got the whole thing. Okay. Any questions? Useful? Good. Okay. Cool. Love that one. That was, that's, yeah. If you need to do a sequence of letters like a to z, you uh -huh. can do a dot dot z. Can it do that? The Sweet. There you go. Extra. Yeah. Essentially, that's what the nest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can also uh, do ranges there, Ruby style ranges. So one dot dot one hundred, uh -huh. and it'll replace with every number one. Uh -huh. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good point. So it's worth <laughs> Absolutely. Very good. <laughs> Speaking of generating numeric lists, perfect segue. Okay, how many of you are familiar with the Seek tool? A few? Okay, good, this is new for some. Great. Seek is great for generating sequences. If you just give it one number, it goes one to that number, it generates a list that you can then put into your, your bash four shell, four loops, right? Okay. Seek four to eight, start at four, go up to eight. Count one to ten, incrementing by two. One, three, five, seven, nine, there you go. So you've got um, start, increment, end, right? Um, let's see here. Uh, you can specify any kind of separator you want. Um, default is going to be new line. Um, if we want to specify a space, just there's your spaces. If you want to separate by dashes, there's dashes. Um, if you want to pad all the things that it generates to make sure they're equal width, pad with zeros, dash W, 1 to 100, there you go. You've got them padded. Okay. Will it do what, like alpha characters as well as numeric? I don't know what it will do if it. It's a number. I think it's, oh. I think it's a number generator. I don't know if it does uh, alphanumerics. Or, but you can pass in format strings, this is useful. Um, for host in, and then we're gonna back tick that thing. Um, seek dash F format, we pass in a format string and everywhere it finds that percent G, it's going to substitute in the number from one to 100 do, there you go. 
And the, uh, the, let's see, dash E gives you an exponential format, one E exponent. Um, F is floating point, and then G is integer. So floating point will give you a zero dot number or something like that. Um, so whatever you need. Um, note also here, this is just a side note in case you haven't seen this before, the use of backticks here like we did up in the, the seek invocation. Anytime you use that backtick invocation, bash just it runs that command and swaps in the output that came from that command right there in, in the sequence. Um, alternatively, you can do this as well. It's another way to express the same sort of thing. Let's see, where are we at? Okay. Um, kind of shifting gears here a little bit. This is another favorite tool of mine. If you ever need to interact with a web server over SSL, you know you can't just tell it to port 443 and start typing in HTTP commands because you're dealing, you've got SSL there. It's, it's expecting to talk SSL with you. So if you use OpenSSL, it has a command called sclient, which does all the SSL negotiation for you and then gives you that essentially now that you, you, you can do a basic or non-encrypted HTTP communications with that server, but over the SSL channel for you. So let me demo that for you. Um, probably easier to see. Uh, let's go out of here. So let's do OpenSSL S client two, and then we pass in connect to um, www.adobe.com. I believe listens on SSL on port 443. You have to specify the port. That's something I used to forget every now and then when I use it. But you've got to remember the port. So if you're listening to SSL on a different non-standard port, you can do that too. And so it'll spit out all of this stuff that um, is also really useful because this tells you if you're looking at your SSL certificate, when does it expire? Do I have the right subject name on there so that uh, my browsers aren't going to complain that I'm going to one host but getting a certificate with the name of a different host? Um, you've got all this nice information about that certificate there. Um, actually, it does have expiration information. We might have to do just a little bit more to get the expiration information out of that. Yes, we will. Okay. That gives you the certificate that's being presented. But now, if I just do my get slash, we'll just do it for purpose, illustration purposes. There's, I can now interact with my web server over the port there, and I don't have to worry about all the SSL stuff. Kind of handy. If I want to inspect uh, expiration dates, I do my, the S client, and I just kind of pipe that through OpenSSL X509 to inspect the certificate, dash text, byte through list. And then we've got our expiration date for the cert. Okay, you can see that becoming a very useful command if you're trying to keep track of when your certs expire. Okay, hopefully that's useful. I find it uh, useful often. Um, there's a ton more. Um, here's a nice uh, arcanic search you could do of all of the stuff that OpenSSL can do, like we did OpenSSL, X509, S client. Look at all this other stuff you can explore. Okay. Uh, again, we don't have time to go into that today, but there you go. There's uh, also another book. I don't own that one. haven't read it. don't know how many pages it is, but there you go, too. Um, LS, the humble LS. How many of you have just scanned through the man page for LS just because you're bored? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Um, what's that? Every day. Every day, yes. <laughs> dash dash full time, show long time stamps, uh, dash B, and f if you're, I think that's Emacs that drops Twiddle files. Is that Vim? Can't remember. If your editor drops files end in twiddle that you don't want to see, dash B gets rid of those for you. Human readable size is very helpful. Um, print the inode number, I don't know why you'd need that. Maybe you're doing like file system hacking, could be useful. Um, append an indicator, so it's visually tells you if it's a, a directory or a link or uh, you know whatever. Um, dash Q, and close each entry in double quotes. This can be really useful because you can specify what quoting style to use. Literal, locale, shell, shell, always see, escape. Shell means, um, if I have a file name that has spaces in it, quote it in the way that the shell will understand that that's a single string. Okay? And if you do shell always, then that means quote everything regardless, whereas a shell means just quote the things that need to be quoted. Okay? So that can be kind of useful if you're scripting in something you don't have to deal with figuring out if, you know, if you're tokenizing with spaces or something like that. Dash R is reverse order, dash R is recursive, cap R is recursive, dash one is just one entry per line. I think that's the default, isn't it? No, actually it doesn't because if, if you can fit more than one. If you need LS to just spit out one entry per line, there you go. Um, show SE Linux context info with dash G. Um, there's our token nod to SE Linux. Uh, separate entries by commas instead of new lines, dash M. That could be useful. Um, sort by file name extension. If you have .txt, .doc, .whatever, dash X, we'll sort it by those extensions. That could be useful. 
Dash lart's a favorite one I use. Long listing all files, reverse sort, and sort by time. Show me what's been most recently modified. Yes? So I've actually used the dash capital I option a couple of times, uh -huh. um, specifically to help people better understand what's going on with iNodes and how they relate to hard links versus soft links and, cool. and things like that, um, and directories. And yeah, it's Very cool. Great clarification, and uh, if you just need to really understand what's going on. Very cool. Um, one, speaking of links, um, one interesting thing to keep in mind, um, when you do an LS, you've got this interesting number out here. That is the number of file system links to that file system object. So sim links, hard links, that kind of thing. Or is it just hard links? It's just hard links. Just hard links, OK. So all of these files just have one reference, probably from the local directory that referenced that file. But dot dot has 56, OK? Kind of interesting. Uh, arcane, yes, very nice. Okay, um, stat. When ls isn't enough, you can use stat and get all sorts of information. Uh, the number of blocks is there's your inode ID. Um, here's a nice octal output of your your file permissions. That can be helpful if you're. Um, let's see, uh, your access, your modify, and your change timestamps. Number of links it's got. Um, the I/O block. That's interesting. Um, they've got format strings. Uh, here's another little thing. If you have commands that are spitting out uh, output um, that you need to process with something else, always look and see if the command can use format strings. Format strings allow you to create a template and swap in values in that template. Like, I want to see these values from the output. That's all I want to see. Format strings are really powerful, really useful. Um, let's see, see stat for more details. So this guy here, percent %A, percent %A on this file, if we call it on that file, it tells us, well, here's the permissions. Here's the visual permissions. Dash A is the, uh, the what was that? Can't remember what that was. Uh, I oh, I know number. Yep, I know number, and then the size. Uh, the the size. Yeah. So here's a uh, substitute for ls-l using stat. I'm um, showing your permissions in octal. So here's your octal permissions, six six four. Uh, here's the number of links. And see this this uh, that uh, that uh, format string that I've got up there. User group. Where's that links? Anyways, can't remember. Um, date, big, long, ugly date um, with your time zone offset file name. There you go. But just to show you that you can format the output of that thing however you want it to be, whatever you need uh, for whatever is consuming it. I think I've looked for that in LS. That's one feature I don't think LS has. So. Um, PS, um, if one, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but there's a lot in the man page there. PS-F gives you a nice tree formatted uh, version of your process tree, so it'll show you your parents, their children, their children, their children. Really, really useful. Um, the invocation there, PS is really weird because you have both like uh, System 5 type options and BSD type options, so you kind of kind of pick and choose which option set you're going to use. Um, uh, the F says, uh, F is the flag for doing the tree. A is, um, it work in BSD, it appears. what's that? It doesn't work in BSD. Oh, it doesn't? It's not on Mac OS, which is. Oh, which is what a shame. Okay. Based on BSD. Okay, that's a shame. Okay, A is all, all you show the username. W, uh, just don't worry about wrapping. Don't cut off the line. Just show it as wide as it is. Um, and X, what does X do? I can't remember what X does. Um, anyways. Uh, what's that? Okay. P.S. Here's one that I use that's really frequently. I use this a lot when I was when you when you need to find. Let's say you have a very high load on your system, and you have a hunch that that high load is caused by I/O weight. Maybe you you have this machine is mounting and file systems from an NFS server, and that mount has gone wonky, and you've got a bunch of processes that are stuck waiting on I/O and they're never going to come back. This is really useful for finding all of those processes. And hopefully you have the task killable option turned on in your kernel so you can kill those NFS things. Otherwise, you're looking at a reboot. Um, PS-EO, this E, this is your, your um, system five uh, option style. O is we're going to specify an output format. Okay, So I'm going to say, I want to see the PID, I want to see the state, I want to see the user, and I want to see the args. This shows me my PID. Here's the state of the process, the user it's running at, and here's the arguments that got passed that it's running. 
This column right here, if you see Ds in there, those Ds mean that it's blocked waiting for I.O. Those are the processes that are going to cause trouble and going to send your load average up. Okay. And look at the man page. There's a ton of other things you can look at for processes um, to list out. Really useful. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's probably well, so PS, all it's doing underneath the hood is reading slash proc, and probably HSOP's doing the same thing. And so HSOP's probably gonna make give you a, a more visual representation of all of those options that you can pull in there. And with pretty colors, yes. So important, at least to me. Um, mm -hmm. DF dash I, how many of you run into the situation where your programs or something is complaining about no disk space left? You look, I'm only using you know twenty percent of the drive. What's going on? First thing you should look at DF dash I. <coughs> How many inodes are in use? Maybe you've got some runaway processes creating two million one-byte files. Okay, and you've blown out the inode table, you've used up all the available inodes on the system. DF-I will show you that, and that's not supposed to be a capital I, that should be a lowercase i, sorry. Again, PowerPoint attempting to be helpful, but failing miserably. Um, so here shows you the, t the uh, total inodes, the number used, the number free, the percentage, where it's mounted, useful. Lots of other stuff in DF you can look at too, it's helpful. Um, LSOF, super useful command. By itself, it'll just give you a listing of all files that are open by any process on the system. Okay? If you want, but it's not just limited to, to traditional files, you can do sockets. If you want to see all of the TCP sockets that are allocated on the machine, LSOF-ITCP, show me all TCP sockets that are open. Also, you can pass in things like TCP, and there's a bunch of arguments. You can pass in IP addresses. You can say, show me all TCP connections open by this connection on this port, that kind of thing. Yes, thank you. Um, dash p pid list all the files that are open by a certain process. Um, let's see. List all open files that are open by cron, HP, or sendmail. List all files open by procs matching this regex. Um, and list everything that's opened in slash var. Yeah. I use that probably every two or three days. And I know the port number, but I don't know the process number. So you can figure out what process, you know, I've got a runaway, I've got a dead process that mm -hmm. is holding a port. Mm -hmm. So if you put a colon and then the port number at the end. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, again, look at the, the man page here. Tons of options there. Um, list all processes which have a particular file open. So that kind of, can be kind of useful. For example, if, um, if for example, you need to change the file, but you don't want to change it out from underneath the running daemon that's referencing that file. If you want to make sure that that database file that you know nobody is using, that you want to blow away, that's taking up two gigabytes of space, you really want to make sure nothing is using it. LSOF the file, and you can verify nothing's got it open. Rip it away and then wait for the DBAs to screen. Um, sort. Uh, I'm using this kind of weird incantation up above just to generate a new line delimited string of, of things. Type it into sort, it'll sort it. You can cut a file into sort, it'll sort it. Uh, an alphabetic sort, sort dash n is a numeric sort. Dash r is a reverse sort. Dash k, really useful. If, you have your fi if your file is delimited by fields, um, dash k, second field delimiter of a pipe, the file. Could be pretty useful. Um, here's a chain I use pretty often. I cat the file, I pipe it to sort. I <coughs> pipe it to unique dash c. Unique, takes, unique has to take a sorted input. And then it will go through that input and it'll remove duplicates. The dash C says, give me a count in front of that to say how many duplicates of that particular line you found. Pipe that into sort dash N, a numeric sort, and you get a nicely organized list of the, how many lines you found of that type in that file. Also, also useful if you're grepping something out of a file, pipe it into this and you can see, maybe I'm looking for how many times I saw a certain string in my access logs. Something like that, pretty useful. Um, Let's see. But the, oh, if you want to sort standard input, um, is the default or specified dash, cat file, pipe through sort. And that's pretty straightforward. Um, oh, this is fun. I discovered this last night while I was looking at all the, the options. Um, sort dash H, but it's only in newer sorts I found. Um, if you do DU to give you a disk usage and you use an S to do a summary DU, and H to give you human readable output, you get these things, you pass it into sort-h, and it can read those and sort them the right way. I used to do this with sort-k and do a numeric sort, but then I have to figure out, is that bytes, is that kilobytes, what is that? Here you go, okay. There's your disk hogs, right there. All right. Um, Vim. Um, Vim has a binary editor built into it, um, dash b. 
Dash D, we talked about vimdiff. Um, dash R, read-only mode. If you're editing a file and you're a little nervous about doing anything to that file, inadvertently touching that file, dash R can save you. Um, if you want to encrypt the file that you're editing, dash X, it's really not a very strong encryption, but there you go. Um, and it'll ask you for a password before you start editing. Um, colon cap X, no. Seems like there is an edit uh, string that'll do the same thing while you're editing a file. Start in restricted mode, this dash Z. What? It is colon cap. Colon cap X? Okay, there you go. Good. I did. Sometimes I have to trust what I remember up here. Sometimes I can't trust what I remember up here. Um, okay, so yeah, dash cap Z is really useful. Say you've got like a QA team or a NOC team or someone you want to hand out um, Vim access to a certain file, but you don't want to hand out everything that Vim can do, like escaping to shells or executing commands as the user it's running as, things like that. Vim dash cap Z takes away all those sharp tools from Zim, Vim and just says, you're just an editor. That's all you can do. So if you want to hand out Vim access in via sudo, there you go. Let's see, watch. Uh, this is a really useful command. Um, you got to see it to see what it does, really. OK, so let's do this. Um, yeah, OK. So watch, um, dash n. We're going to repeat this every second. And we're going to do the command, actually single ticks cat proc mem info. So we're going to look at what's happening with our memory usage in real time. And every second, you'll see it's going to update what's happening there. Ding, ding. See what's going on. I just said. Yeah. You can do that, too. Yeah. Excellent, yep. Okay, so um, for the visually impaired like myself, dash D will highlight any changes that happen on each invocation. So there you go. Okay, I like hearing that. That's good. Good, good, good. That's good. Good sounds to hear. Okay, cal. Stupid, simple, but I use it. It's great. You need a calendar? What, uh, what day of the week is the 15th? Okay, on of, of June of 2014, there you go. Cal-3 gives you last month, this month, and next month. That's all it does. There you go. <laughs> excellent, excellent. BC. How many are familiar with BC? Okay, new for some. It's a command line calculator. Okay, I love this thing. In fact, I have in in my my X setup, I have a keyboard shortcut shortcut, so I could do I do Control Alt B, and it pops up this little window with BC running in it, so I can just do my command line calculator because I can't stand the calculator apps trying to click on oh that button, wrong button. You know? Okay. So you can echo strings of math into BC L. Dash L says turn on the standard libs, otherwise you don't get like floating point math. Um, and, uh, or you can run it interactively. Um, so here, 3 times 2 is 6. Let's set the output base to 16. What is 12 in base 16? Well, that's C, right? Okay. Um, 16 in base 16 is 10, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, 10, right? Okay. Um, output base equals 2. We want to look in binary. What's 32 in binary? There you go. Um, 345, 345, that in binary is that. Let's set the output base to 10. We want to get decimal numbers again. But our input base is 2. What's 111 binary in, des in base 10? That, well, that's 7. Okay? Um, 2 to the 10th power is 1024. So it's just, and, and there's a lot more to it. You can set up functions. You can set up all sorts of if-then expressions, programmatic expressions. <coughs> I like it. Um, RPM. Uh, and again, my apologies to the, yeah? Um, for people who like reverse Polish notation, there's also DC. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I. Well, at least is BC, but uh, for RPN. Reverse Polish for you. Very good, thank you. And I always run into that because I mistype CD and find myself <laughs> in DC. So if you ever wonder why that happened, you're in DC, right? <laughs> okay, there you go. F. Yeah, you would think, right? Okay. So RPM, um, list everything installed by a particular package, RPM QL, QF, where, which package installed this? Um, is everything installed by, open, by RPM, or by the OpenSH package intact? RPM-cap V. Now, RPM in its database stores what the file permissions were for your, all the files in the package, timestamps, um, MD5 sums of the file. Really good to see if somebody has changed something that got installed by an RPM. This thing down here, you get these markers. Um, this tells me the timestamp on this file has changed since it got installed. Um, the size has changed here, the MD5 sum. I can't read that one because I don't have enough permissions. 
Um, C here says, let's see, where is it at? Oh, attribute markers. So this has been marked by RPM as a config file, if you're familiar with the RPM format, uh, building RPMs. Is everything installed by RPM intact? Cap V, A for all packages. Pretty useful um, if you're using RPM. My apologies to the Ubuntu and Debian crowd on that one. Um, query formats, again, this idea of query formats. Um, the default QA format for RPM does not list epics, does not list arc, arch. Um, and so if you need to see that, just pass in a query for format, pull, throw in those kind of weird looking tokens and you get a nice output then. This thing is really nice. If someone's really borked things up on your file system and you want to restore all the permissions, RPM dash set perms, open SSH, or you could loop through an RPM QA output and set perms fix everything. So RPM will restore everything in that package back to the permissions, ownership, and everything it needed. Okay. This fixes permissions, this sets UIDs, GIDs. If you want to fix everything in your file system, loop through QA. There you go. Okay. Oh, where are we at? Okay, we're close. Only one yum thing I'm going to do, distro sync. Really good if you've deployed a system and accidentally you start referencing another repo that you didn't want to. Yank that repo, run distro sync. It'll go out and look at the repos it's supposed to be looking at. Do I have packages that are newer than I should have? It'll downgrade them. Okay, that's kind of kind of was useful for me in the recent past. Um, awk. Okay, I, again, don't have much time to go into this. Um, I've got a problem. Show me all server 500 errors in my Apache logs. Just use grep, right? Grep 500 out of that. But what if 500 shows up in some of the URLs? But it's not as bad as 500. Don't want that. Um, so awk. Um, look for every line where field 10. But we know that uh, the status code is in field 10 of each line. Look for um, this pattern in field 10, so field 10 matches this pattern out of my access log, and that shows you everything there. But print only, I only want to see field 7 and 8 from those lines. So match that pattern, so field 10 match that pattern. For all those lines, print just field 7 and 8 from your Apache log. What if we have fields that have potentially multiple spaces so we can't tokenize by space? It's not very easy um, in the fields before 10, but we know that the the, the field 10 is two fields from the end, and that there's not that problem between those. This little expression says the number of fields. So take the number of fields minus one, or exactly that should be minus two. Sorry, bad example. If that field matches this out of there, then print it. Okay. Um, your basic invocation pattern with awk is find lines that match that pattern, do something with them. Okay. We could spend a whole session on awk, probably. Don't have time. Um, note about man pages. A lot of them are going to say, look at the info. How many of you looked at the info pages? OK. Um, run info, type H for help. And there's like a bazillion commands you can run inside this. The GNU utils have much more thorough documentation in the info pages than they do in the man pages in many cases. Um, and remember that some man pages have different sections. I once found, um, like, if you're doing a man select for the, Linux, the C library select, sometimes it's on a different man page, man page section than just man select. So you might have to do, like, man2 select or man8 select, something like that. Okay, and there, um, when you download the slides, there's a bunch more assignments for you to go um, look through, explore. Uh, let's see, just any of these I want to talk about. Um, oh, this thing is really cool. I'll show you that real quick. We're out of time, though. Shoot. Way out of time. This is um, an alternative to wget or curl. I'll just show you the, the web page for it. Um, basically, it, you can, it, you, you can in, do HTTP commands. Um, it can parse and, and colorize JSON for you. Um, it's just really a good Swiss Army knife for dealing with HTTP. Um, and I'll let you look at all the rest of those. All the stuff I wish we could sit and talk about. Um, so there's some other sources. I get a lot of interesting tools that come out of the uh, Hacker News, YCombinator.com. We're going to auction, raffle off this Unix Power Tools Linux in a nutshell. Look at your man pages, your info pages. Um, here's a couple of image credits for images I used. And that's me. I'll have the slides up uh, in a little bit on brainshed.com. You can talk to me at uh, Dan Hanks at Twitter. Yes, sir?